Welcome to our second webinar in the Let's Explore series. Before we begin proceedings, we're just going to run you through some technical parts of the webinar, just to make sure you're up to speed and you get the best possible experience. The audio is for your computer speakers or headset, and your microphone will be muted throughout this session. However, there will still be opportunities to engage with us throughout the session. You may ask questions using the question panel, control panel. Our team of moderators will be watching this and will answer your questions at the end of the webinar. So sit back, relax, enjoy the webinar. I'll now hand you over to Richard Parker from Webfleet Solutions. Welcome to our webinar, Getting Back Behind the Wheels Safely, part of our thought leadership series and that we have now moved to an online format for 2020. Uh, let's just a few, a few introductions first. My name is Richard Parker. I have 19 years of fleet industry experience, um, historically helping clients improve their fleet policies and funding through their data analysis. Um, I'll hand you over to Stephen Lewis for an introduction. So I'm Stephen Lewis. So I've been in the telematics industry for over 12 years, working with fleets of many sizes, implementing integrated telematics solutions but also a focus on how companies can use telematics data to improve driver behavior and emit any risks. And I'm Chris Stone, uh, the former head of finance for a large uh, UK utility company. Um, as an accountant, uh, my focus has always been around data and analytics. Uh, I founded uh, TDS Ultra about four years ago now, and I've built the company up to analyze millions of lines of data a day. And here we've gained a lot of experience with, with different companies uh, that I want to try and share with you. Thank you both. Okay, so what we'll be looking at in today's discussion. Well, firstly, we're going to look at the effect that COVID-19 had on vehicle movement in the UK. What are the post-pandemic risks that are now present for our drivers on, out on the roads? What role does health and well-being and safety play in that respect? We're going to examine what is the new normal for driving, um, both to and from the office and for work out on the roads. How can your business and your drivers prepare for what the new world looks like? What will technology do to help you along the way and, and mitigate risk and improve safety? And finally, we'll show you a resource toolkit that we've put together that will enable you to act on some of the things that have been discussed in today's webinar. Okay, so what has happened to vehicle movements in the UK roads? Well, Geotab and ourselves have done a bit of work over 3, 3 million vehicles, um, looking at driving time, number of trips for, for fleets out in the UK marketplace. And you can see there's a couple of um, very distinct uh, points of interest on that. The first being the significant drop after lockdown, where movement went back to about 50% of normal levels. Moving forward to the 22nd of May, when we can clearly see that the recovery of that movement has been very slight and is now only at 65% of its normal levels. So it's clearly a very marked change in the number of vehicle movements in the UK. This is back. We've seen up. that with some of the the, vehicle, the companies we've been looking after is just how much of a change in the way that they look after their vehicles, uh, vehicles going months without moving. Um, it's quite a, it's a fundamental change in the way the vehicle activities are being monitored. Absolutely. And uh, Fleet News has backed that up, Chris, with um, the, the data from the research that they've been doing that's saying one out of every 10 company cars is currently not, is, is only being driven for work. So 90% of vehicles are effectively stationary and only one in 20 of all fleets out there have 75% of their company cars operational. So that absolutely backs up the data that's coming through from, from TDS. And we've so only seen that in the that, last few weeks, coming up to the, from the 75%, that's only very recent. You know, it, it's been very, absolutely. it's been mid-40s mid and 50s for such a long time. And some and only some vehicles actually being used. So despite that saying, you know, one in 10 are being used, some aren't being used at all for the last three months. So the first time these vehicles will move will be be, you know, be their first time for several months. Correct. Mm -hmm. And, and, and yeah. the nature of that driving will be those that are going back to work because they can't fulfill their working requirements from home. Um, as well as those people whose drives are working, you know, work, their working lives are driving for a living. So all of those will become a fact. So now we understand that the impact of this pandemic has been very significant on the volume of vehicle movements in the UK uh, for quite a sustained and significant period of time. What's it going to be like for when drivers actually come and get back behind the wheel? Uh, Stephen, any thoughts? 
Yeah, so I think obviously we've all had that holiday feeling, that two-week holidays when we've been away, come back to work and we can't remember our username or password for our work laptop. And I think what we've been through is obviously far from a holiday in the past three months, but I think we need to be aware that we will have those same risks when we come back into a vehicle and also be a little bit rusty as well. I think up until last week, between the 15th of March and last the end of last week, I did 28 miles in my car. That was it. And I've been in it three times. So you've really got to be careful and get yourself back into that car and understand that maybe you need to re-familiarize yourself with exactly how it works. It's a silly question when you feel you've been driving for 20 years or even longer, but this is the biggest gap you've probably had without significant driving since you passed your test. And you might not have driven the car, as I said, or you might have been driven a family member's car. So just simple things. How does the radio work? How do the windscreen wipers work? Things like that, because you don't want to get caught out trying to do safety things like windscreen wipers on the motorway. If you don't know how they, if you can't remember how they work or you get a little bit confused on how they work. So just take yourself back to basics. Uh, similar on the roads, you know, the roads aren't as busy. We can see that in the data. So it's to understand what the actual speed limits of roads are again, because you can't just follow the traffic anymore because you can quite easily speed. And we've seen that and we can see it in the data. I know, Chris, you've seen that in the data with some of your customers as well. Especially in the 30 also, zones. Well, it's that yeah. um, it's the fact that vehicles, you, you couldn't usually speed in the 30 zone. You were in traffic, you were bumper to bumper following buses. And now because there's less traffic on the on the actual road itself, you find yourself creeping above 30s. And we're seeing more and more occasions in, in the lower speed limit zones uh, of speeding occurring, which is which is just dangerous, especially with you know, the amount of people possibly on the road now, the amount of bikes that are now on the roads. Uh, it, it's a fundamentally different uh, place to drive now for people. Exactly. And it's also to understand if we're talking about cars familiarization and getting used to cars again everybody else who is on the road is in a very similar position to you so it's to understand that people will make mistakes out there and to give yourself a little bit more room and a little bit more space when you're out on the roads if you do find yourself in any traffic because you can't expect people to do exactly what they did before yeah i know one of the things you and i were talking about Stephen, was um you and you had this where you know you're running along a road and to keep social distancing you almost jump off the curb and you know, from from a driver's yeah. perspective, there's there's perhaps been a more awareness, even you know, in 40 zones in urban freeways and things like that, where you may find pedestrians and cyclists suddenly moving out and be, and making themselves an obstruction. Yeah, and then vehicle maintenance. There's been a lot of information out there over the past month or so about vehicle maintenance, about making sure mm. that the vehicle is ready to go back on the road. But again, we can't, we can't say that more. We need to make sure that the vehicle is ready and that the brakes work, the, bat the battery's charged up and the tires are in a good condition. You don't want to be driving on, on the road like I would here. The first time I used the brakes is probably going from 70 miles an hour down to mm. 50 or 60. So you just need to make sure that the, uh, that the brakes are working before you get out there and try and do some serious distance in a car. Exactly. I, I looked at my car last night, funnily enough, Stephen and Chris, and uh, there are actually cobwebs on the wheel arch, which tells me everything <laughs> I need to know about, about getting that vehicle checked properly and um, before I try any kind of journey that's going to you know, involve braking from speed or anything else. Yeah, like exactly. And, it's, you know, it's the washer fluid and things like that. I mean, my car's covered in dust and it's just, you know, that's going to go off the bonnet onto the windscreen, driving down the motorway and things like that. And there's flies around because it's summer. So just make sure all those things are topped up as well before you get back out in the car. And even the, the use, using the vehicle itself, uh, if it's a vehicle maybe you're not used to, so you may potentially have been at home, you haven't been using your commercial vehicle, you're going to be going from a you know a small car that you've used maybe to go to the shops or for a walk and so forth with, to all of a sudden yeah, now you're back in a you know big three and a half ton commercial vehicle uh, to go driving down the road, different dynamics, different sizes, even different braking distances. You know, if you're in a small car, you'll brake quite quickly and nimbly. All of a sudden you're, you're driving a big commercial vehicle that's actually going to need a far far bigger stopping distance. So it this really is familiarizing yourself again with that vehicle, uh, that change, where things are, a completely different uh, scenario to be in. Yeah, and it's it's the parking sensors, it's the reverse cameras that you might be used to in your own personal car that aren't there in the commercial vehicle or aren't there in the van that you're going to get back into drive and it's quite easy to bump something if you're just not yeah. paying attention to what's going on and you think, you put yourself back in your little car and now when you're in a big van again. So easy done, but we need to be aware of it as a driver just to uh, make sure we mitigate those risks. Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think also 
another good topic that we've discussed a lot as Web3 Solutions this year is health and well-being. And I think it's time, a really good opportunity to kind of reset where we are with that. I think it's a big topic at the moment as we get drivers back onto the road. They've got a lot more a play now around COVID-19, a lot more what they see as risks to them and their family. And I think it's good just to understand health and well-being as a topic and how it can help drivers and how it can help businesses have better drivers. Any thoughts, Richard? Yeah, well, let's stick with the you know the car itself, I guess, and it's not quite the order necessarily of the slide, but driver ergonomics, we've talked about the outside of the car and the physical aspects of keeping that maintained. But many of us will, I think, be, um, we, we've entered into health regimes, you know, in this three-week lockdown. Some of us may have lost weight, others haven't, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but we may have different shapes. And we're certainly not accustomed in our muscle and structure to being back in the car for the periods of time that, that perhaps I have. I know that, you know, Stephen, you and I discussed the other day, you had a journey and your right leg was particularly achy <laughs> after what would, would normally have been a, a, tip, a normal drive for you. And, you, you know, you felt that in your, in your, your own physical well-being. Yeah. So again, let's make sure that drivers are rechecking their driving positions. The seats are well adjusted. The lumbar is where it needs to be. You know, the visibility of the mirrors and, uh, and everything else is set properly before people get out and the distance from the seat to the accelerator to the brake isn't gonna cause those physical muscle challenges that, that perhaps, you know, they wouldn't necessarily have done beforehand. It's just about planning for that return back into the car. And we talked quite a lot about the, the pre-planning. So this is, you know, understanding getting the vehicle right, making sure the seat's adjusted, things like that. But actually, maybe it's a change in planning for your day-to-day -day routine. So do you need to plan more time for stops? Do you need to actually plan to take stops at all? Because actually, you might not want to be stopping at service stations. So does that mean from a, a nutrition perspective, are you going to take packed lunches with you? Um, as you know, for, from a school's perspective, they're not reopening uh, the canteens for, for the children. So it's going to be making back to packed lunches again. So actually... Is it worth putting a packed lunch together for yourself to take in the car to make sure you've got snacks and bits with you because the drive might be slightly longer than you planned if you're going to take your time and take a different route actually just bringing that whole day of planning together you know should, should you plan to be uh, at a meeting for nine o'clock you know why, why would you plan to put yourself under pressure to be there for nine should we be adapt the way we we operate our working day to have a you know potentially a shorter working day but actually meetings from 10 10 30 to make sure we avoid traffic to make sure we don't put vehicles on the road when we don't need to to unnecessarily start the day in places too early just just adjusting yeah. and thinking about how we can adapt I, I don't think we can anticipate that things are going to go back to the way they were straight away so you know as you say plan the day things might take a little bit longer we know it takes a lot longer going to the supermarket at the moment so if you need to stop at a service station to pick up a coffee or something like that that you would do routinely in uh, a few months ago that's going to take a little bit longer even if you can do it now so maybe just as you say take these things with you or what took 15 minutes might take 45 minutes now so get those things planned in properly and don't be rushing around because that's what will happen you'll just rush 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 to get to meetings and not think about the things that you need to do and allow absolutely. people to be late isn't it you know if, if yeah we're always yeah, no one likes someone to be late but actually yeah. you no know, should, should we not be giving out to people to be, being late for a meeting actually you know, set open meeting times, get here safely rather than get here quickly. Uh, quite yeah. a lot of the companies we work with on you know, within distribution and things are give, put under quite a lot of pressure. We hear the stories about delivery drivers being put under pressure to get a delivery done within a certain time and to meet certain um, standards. But actually, you know, realistically, should we take that pressure off our day-to-day -day activities as we're returning to work and actually just, just arrive safely being the priority rather than arriving on times and deadlines that are unnecessary? Well, and also in, in think about the right. time. So, and also think about the time that you're that you're setting the meetings for. You know, does it have to be a nine o'clock meeting, or actually, can you make it half past ten and allow that normal traffic flow to have disappeared? Um, you know, there's, there's some research suggesting that the common times for people's most fatigueness and everything else is between two a.m. and six a.m. So, if you've got shift workers, be aware of that. And also, surprisingly, actually, between two and four p.m. in the afternoon. You know, the, the natural dips in the body's energy levels. So, you know, start thinking about actually when you are setting meetings, are you potentially increasing your risks of fatigue and tiredness, you know, through poor planning? Yeah. Well, as you say, as we said, we can't just go back to the way it was. No. So one of the other things, just, just before we move on to this, it was around that we wanted to talk about was around nutrition and fitness as well, thinking about, about that in the in the well-being. I know that as you say, Stephen, at, at um, Webfleet, we've been 
uh, spending quite a bit of time th this year examining what nutrition, fitness and, and overall well-being is like for people um, who drive for a living. Um, and if it's, an it's anecdotal, but you know, it feels to me that people are eating better through through this uh, through this epidemic. And for me personally, I still can't get flour and rice at my local supermarket on a regular basis. It says that people are thinking about what they eat in a more careful way. And, and I guess the, the encouragement is going forward that if people have established this good practice is to try and, as people come back to work, not to fall back to the old ways and make sure that the balance of nutrition and fruit and the right, the right mix of vitamins is still in people's diets to ensure that the risk of fatigue or, you know, ill health through back at work is, is, not, is not resurrected. You can't help it when you're on the road other than to find, you know, the, the, the food on the road isn't great. You know, it's, it's easy to grab something quick that the quicker you in a brief stop, uh, you want quick and easy food. And that's not always going to be your, your healthiest option. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've all done quite well to avoid it because, well, firstly, because it's closed. That's the best way to avoid it. But actually, yeah, we, we've, we've had healthier eating options, a lot of more home cooking and things like that. So actually, yeah, do we need to be more prepared before we head out on the road and actually think about what we're going to need while we're out and about? Yeah. And how can businesses encourage things like, you know, I know when, you know, in the office environments I used to work, fruit bowls were a common a common occurrence in, in modern life. Actually, can something be brought into place for those mobile workers that help them access, you know, and encourage the uptake of fruit and, you know, and things on the journeys to, to get the right nutrition into them? Exactly. You know, can, can companies provide drivers with cool bags or things like that that they can put stuff in to take with them out on the road? And it's, a, it's a simple thing that a company could do, but it means a lot to a driver and actually encourages them and reminds them that that's probably something I should be doing. Water bottles, yeah. things like that, that we've seen done in the past that really do help drivers you know, drink a, a litre of water every couple of hours to make sure that they're you know, maintaining that, those fluid levels and things when they're out. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're all things that are going to help keep tiredness at bay, aren't they? So. So that's great. So thanks for that. So, right, we've talked um, about around the nutrition, the well-being. Now, the new normal is, is a phrase that is becoming very commonplace in, in our language at the moment. But um, for us guys, what do you think the normal looks like for, uh, for drivers in, in particular? I think we, we touched on it a couple of slides ago, but I think we need to bring it back. It's pretty important is how many or how busy the road ne network is going to be and not just necessarily and probably not vehicles as much as it used to be but more drive but more riders cyclists and walkers and runners as well is a big thing we see it a lot where driving down roads and small roads where people are trying to use the road network not just the pavements to do their social distancing and obviously that's going to be in place for a long time and people are going to be keep on doing it so we just need to remind drivers that you know these roads are pretty dangerous anyway but they're going to be even more dangerous in the future and for the foreseeable future as well as social distancing stays in place and they need to think again about using them for uh for shortcuts and things like that because they're just they're going to be dangerous and they are going to be busy so try and stay away from those quieter roads we've seen our local council putting in uh, they've changed the dual carriageway uh, into the center of brighton um mm -hmm. into you know, two lanes now so it's it's gone from a two-lane road into one lane is purely um, cyclists and the other lane is then for, for the cars. So they're actually putting in bigger, better measures. And I think we're going to see a bit more of that as the public yep. transport is, is hugely reduced, um, that people will be using more and more bikes, especially throughout the summer. We're going to see that wave of it happening. Uh, people on bikes that possibly aren't, haven't been on a bike for a long time. Um, it, yep. It's going to be quite quite a big difference. Um, and the, the way that uh, cyclists are on the road, you know, that it's, it's quite, uh, they will overtake each other. They won't necessarily, they can't see behind them. So as a driver, you've got to be just that much more aware of a cyclist, especially cyclists that haven't been on the road for a long time. Exactly. And it's always been a couple of cyclists and many cars, and that's probably going to be the opposite at the moment, where there's going to be lots more cyclists and just you trying to fight your way down the road in your car. So you to have to be prepared for it. And I say they don't go as quickly as you can in your car. So maybe drive along at the same speed as a cyclist can go is probably good advice and not to get caught up in, in their games because they do like to overtake each other, as yeah. you say. <laughs> and think about the times of day when when it's going to be busier with those cyclists as well. So in my own experience, you know, where I live, it, it's quiet at lunchtime. But come four o'clock, I think a lot more people who are still having to work from home as well are shutting their laptops, you know, taking the children out on the bikes. And that's something else that I've noticed, not just adult cyclists. There's a lot more families out cycling. So you've got 
longer protracted lengths of road that you might have to pass um, yep. you know as a group of cyclists so think about the time it takes you to get past that group you know make sure there's no bends and, and it is safe in terms of operating that kind of thing well, as you say, it's a, like a new commute, uh, a commuter start. There's still, there's still people commuting. There's still people having to be at work uh, within office hours and actually for, for shift work. And so it's quite, mm -hmm. it definitely is still there's busier and quieter times. But I think actually offices, a lot of offices aren't reopening yet. And if they are reopening, they're, op they're opening at very, very you know, minimal capacity. Um, a lot of blue chip companies have actually said that, you know, they're not expecting people to be back in their offices uh, until the new year. So. I think that the commute is going to be very different. Uh, the, the traffic and the and the roads themselves are going to be quieter, but it's adapting to the way you drive. You you may have never noticed going around a corner because you're going around that corner at 60, 70 miles per hour every time. But all of a sudden, when you're going around it uh, at a lower speed, you, you're going to see obstacles that things you didn't realize. You're going to not necessarily be anticipating the road ahead as much as you're used to, and um, because there's a lot more going on around you. Um, similar to you, when you drive at night on your own, um, you, you do tend to drive naturally quicker. And then your awareness is a lot lower because you've not got objects to, to measure off and measure against. And obviously, and traffic itself slows you down. It does change Absolutely. the behavior. So yeah. we, we see more speeding, we see more serious accidents. So it's, it's just trying to make sure that people are more aware and think a bit more about their drive rather than that day-to-day -day routine where you get yourself into and you just off you go. Yeah, it's like, it's like the perfect storm with a quieter road when we're talking about people being more tired because they're not used to driving or getting up early and having to have a couple of hours an extra long day because they need to drive into the office and then when they are driving home from the office it's quieter roads yeah. and you know being alert is about understanding having the traffic on the road and on trying to think about what people are going to do and that's what keeps you alert but if the roads are quiet then you can speed as you say but there's not the traffic to keep you alert and it's just yeah there's opportunities there to have some, some incidents so, so yeah, just to be aware of those things there's, there's a, moving on there's there's a lots of um there's lots of material now coming about actual uh, social distancing within vehicles and cleanliness but do you mm -hmm. just want to touch on you know your thoughts around that for you know for for less professional people what they might want to do where the journeys are just single occupancy etc yeah well I, I think we need to probably cover both parts because it's important you know the, i think for for vans and things like that you know obviously the guidance is if you can you know it's single occupancy people shouldn't be having two two people or two members of staff in the van or even three or four members of staff in some instances it should be one person so that will probably increase the number of vans on the road when people do start going back to work because uh yeah they can't share if uh, and then there's things around that as well so even if they have to share because you are allowed to share if there is no other option they need to have rules in place around only one person drives the vehicle only one person even refuels the vehicle for instance because you can't share the keys and things like that and then if you uh and then once you're finished with the vehicle it needs to be cleaned you need to clean the vehicle you need to make sure it's sanitized before anybody else can use the vehicle but I think it's probably also good practice if you think about your personal car as well or if your company car to have that sort of same attitude to it because these vehicles are in places and even the handles, people touch handles or rub against handles in parking, in car parks and things like that. So keeping the vehicle clean yourself, even if you're the only one that drives it, is probably a good idea. And also think about when you're in a car park where you're parking it, you know, maybe park it away from some other vehicles so people don't touch it and things like that, because the science is still out about how long this virus can stay alive for on on surfaces. But, you know, anywhere between a couple of hours to eight hours and you could probably touch that handle a few times if someone's touched it or touched the door or something like that, because we've seen it where people use your car to get into their car and things like that. So. You just need to be careful and I think be aware. We always wash our hands when we get into the house now. That's the another new normal that we're learning to live with. So maybe we need to make sure we have sanitizer in the vehicle and make sure we wash our hands when we get in the vehicle and regularly clean, regularly clean the vehicle. If we've been out into the supermarket, do we just touch the steering that's wheel without, without yeah. cleaning our put hands again? On, put your sanitizer on, do, yeah. do that as part exactly. of your routine. Exactly. And then... And then, I mean, we can't accept that that's going to happen all the time. Sometimes you might forget. So we need to think about that and we need to clean the vehicle. So whatever the rules are for, you know, commercial vehicles and vans, we've covered them. They're important about single occupancy. I think anybody driving a company cars, that, that is their own car that they use for work. I think they should follow similar guidelines as well. I think picking up on your parking point as well, uh, Stephen, around 
you know, as we do start to move back to perhaps going to the office, you know, and or manufacturing mm-hmm. up, you know, with the car parks and, and people operating that is thinking about it, whether a shift patterns or if you've got large entrance of people at one time, how you organize your car parking to minimize the risk of people getting inside of social distancing, because we know that car parks are always restricted and tight for space. Yep. So it's thinking about as you well, bring people back, how you ask them to park and where to park and, and organize. Well, that it, it, is, it is a recommendation as well for staggered start times and staggered finish yeah. times and things like that. So these places yeah. don't become, and that's, and that's in any walk of life now, yeah. for any work related activity, if it's parcel delivery or parcel pickup, it's, we don't want people loading vehicles all at once we need to stagger that well um, opening the doors be, within a yeah next yeah, to each exactly. other things like that exactly Absolutely. all those sort of things so i think we just need to carry those forward into what we do and i think i think over the last three months we've learned to live with it in our own yeah. personal life and i think the message you need to take forward is whatever we do in our personal life we don't we don't forget that when we go back to work we need to yeah. we need to look after ourselves and and uh, companies also need to look after their employees as well and remind them that these are probably things they need to do Absolutely. Okay, so we, we've yeah we've now looked um, at what the situation is to start with, what might be the new risks, and what the new normal is. Um, I think it's about time we sort of got into how can business and drivers actually start to prepare in a practical sense to to kind of bring people back to driving at work safely um, and with uh, good physical and mental health. So. You know, Chris, from your perspective, you know, you've got your experience in the, in the past. What do you think people can do around sort of like driver policy? We've done a lot of work with, with companies to refresh their driver policy, uh, which is not what's necessarily required here, but maybe uh, an addendum to the existing policy to add in some of the COVID-19 measures that need to be in place. And actually, maybe just a, a highlight to some of the particular points, uh, such as brakes. You know, they're, they're recommended within the driver policy. You know, working with a lot of drivers, the, the feedback we get from them is that you know they don't get time to have their breaks. They're under a lot of pressure to maybe meet certain delivery targets and times. It's trying to change the attitude of the business to actually uh, perform efficiently, uh, but not necessarily apply that pressure to the driver to be uh, rushing around quite as much as maybe they were pre uh, the pandemic. And make sure that their vehicles are equipped accordingly. They've got the right equipment in place uh, to be able to support them. And some of that may be technical based. So whether that's their uh, the navigation system, their journey planning, their um, actually the scheduling system, making sure that they've got all of that in place to to keep themselves uh, compliant. Yeah. So uh, and you know we, we we're all very and we're doing one now. We're all very familiar, much more familiar with webinars and things like that. So maybe a good time to uh, you know hold a, you know a driver based webinar for internally for your company and just you know revisit some of those addendum points, the top 10 key kind of points within the policy, just to reiterate and make sure that people are, you know, adhering to them at this time? Yeah, I think they've, they've got to just draw attention to it. Um, and then, and the webinars are a great way of communicating things and change the way that drivers uh, drivers behave or make that decision to even go out and drive. You know, do, do we need to have, uh, with the way we've got webinars and communication tools now in place, do we need to be at that meeting? Do we need to actually travel at all? Uh, and that, that's that's a different way to to plan your productivity and, and your workload uh, to maybe reduce the amount of miles you'll even do. Definitely, everybody is going to be driving a lot less this year going forward. And I think actually, hopefully, behaviours will change in the way people attend meetings or visit customers uh, to do more virtually, which is going to reduce costs. It's going to reduce um, the amount of traffic on the road and actually the use of these vehicles themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think and- it's a good opportunity sorry Richard I think it's a good opportunity for companies to to reset really and have like a start from scratch again with their drivers just to as I said they've always had these policies in places they might need a little bit of refinement but they should communicate them again we've discussed that but they've also probably got a lot of technology that they wanted to use or had ideas to use and maybe this is a good opportunity to get it out dusted off and really use that technology what it was intended for because mm. people are there, people are willing to learn at the moment. People want to be taught things and are happy to go on these webinars where it was always, oh, I'll go on that webinar if I have time or I'll do that if I have time. And people seem to have a lot of time at the, on their hands at the moment to get to get to grips with this stuff and really engage with it and start using it. And it's a good opportunity for businesses as well. And they, they need to grasp that. Yeah, and it's not going to be as busy. Going back to work in the next few months is going to be quieter. Yeah, there's going to be less to do. Um, and there's going to be less people around. So it is going to be very different. There might be different journey plans, different routes and route scheduling that might need to be adjusted. 
um, through having less customers or less business actually in place. So if we go back to doing the same things, uh, we're never going to actually move forward. So re reiterating, as you said, Stephen, to, to start again, if you're a new act like a new business, how would you approach mm -hmm. your driving policy, your driving behavior, your management of drivers, how many vehicles you've got, the type of vehicles, for it, actually almost look at the business as a fresh start. Yeah, yeah absolutely. 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 Brilliant. So, so moving around to vehicles, I guess one of the things that I kind of wanted to draw out, we've talked enough about the brakes, the, the water levels and everything else, but one of the things that's always been, you know, quite high on my radar is the fact that, you know, vehicles do like to be driven. Um, they don't like being sat around and actually, you know, whilst there's no proof, it is a bit anecdotal, the chances are that some vehicles may become less reliable when they're out on the road being driven again for the first time in months. So for me, I think it sits alongside the policy to ensure that businesses are checking the vehicles that are out there have the high vis jackets in. They do have the warning triangles, and and they are being clear with their drivers about the expectation of what to do in the event that the vehicle does break down. Do they have the correct numbers in the vehicle to call? You know, my experience from Fleet is the driver card, which gets handed out, you know, the entrance to the new vehicle invariably is gone within the first few months because of change of driver or or whatever. So, just revisiting, ensuring that those drivers actually have the necessary kit inside the car that in the event that the worst happens, that they can act safely, appropriately, and without too much stress. And we're, we're working with a particular company that they have a thousand vehicles that haven't moved for three months. And rather than just let the driver go out there and drive them off, they're actually putting in a policy itself to do a proper you know, check on the vehicle, make sure it's actually up to standard. So not just assuming that you're getting back into it in three months to, from three months of not driving it and just driving it down the road and hoping for the best. They're actually putting in place um, certain measures, uh, potentially call outs and servicing that is uh, going to be done on the vehicles because we know from the data that they definitely haven't moved or even the engine started. So it's, yeah. it's yeah. being able to use that data to, and most companies have that. Most companies have a telematic system in place. They know what's what's moved and what hasn't. Uh, and anything under a certain tolerance should actually be you know, probably you know, possibly you know, serviced or maintained or checked uh, to make sure it is, it is compliant. Uh, not to mention the MOT dates. You know, obviously, the MOT was delayed. It was allowed to, to overlap. But actually, now it's missed that renewal reminder. Um, is it now not going to come up until the following year? Because that renewal reminder might not be put forward for a couple of weeks or months. So actually, you know, checking, does it does have a valid MOT? Has the tax been renewed on it? Just st standard things that we've forgotten about uh, over the last three months that just need to be reiterated within the policies to maintain those vehicles. Absolutely. Yeah. Stephen, what are your thoughts on sort of the work node and technology? You're, you know, you're quite up on that sort of thing. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I briefly touched on it before, but I think it's the same. I think lots of people, as you say, Chris, have telematics and lots of people have technology within their business. Maybe it hasn't been used to its fullest up until this point. And as we say, it's an opportunity to really look at it and people aren't gonna be as busy in some scenarios. Some obviously are more busier than they were, but in a lot of scenarios, they're not gonna be as busy. So it's a good opportunity to look at those technology projects that maybe didn't- it's a time to optimize them. Yeah, take off as well as you would have liked. You know, did you get the best out of your telematics? Are you getting the best out of your route scheduler? Are you getting the best out of your planning? Whatever it might be, and just reset and just look at the whole business on how that technology interacts with that business and can you make it better? I think it's a good opportunity to take a little bit of stress off because those technologies are there for two reasons, usually to, to take a little bit of stress off the workforce by helping them and assisting them do their job and also obviously try and make the business some more money which are two important things for them at the moment so it's a really good opportunity to look at that yeah and uh and, and productivity as well you know you i know you raised this with me it's a really as a you know two guys who you know have sales targets you know to work for and everything else you know um a really interesting kind of point you raised to me the other day actually about how businesses measure you know, what yeah. is a successful outcome for that day's work? Exactly. Well, we all we all look at it, don't we, to how, how are we productive and how do we measure ourselves? And it's usually probably around how many miles I've driven that week or that month when I look at my business mileage claim at the end of the month. And that's obviously not the best way. Is it the most productive? Probably not. Is it more dangerous now? with the way the roads are and the way we have been operating up until this point. So from a business perspective, it might be a way to look at that and how we measure staff. Is it on the number of deliveries they do or how on time they are? Is it the fact they just got them done? And is it how many miles I did or is it how much I sold or do we need to look at those targets because we can't put pressure on people to get out there because it's not the ideal place to be at the moment. 
it's yeah, a, end up having meetings for meetings. More dense than it has happened. Yeah. yeah, well, exactly. You know, we're, we are, we, you know, we used to do 1,000, 1,500 miles a month and we're probably desperate to get out of the home office and get back out on the road and go and see some customers and try and do what we used to do. But we need to look at ourselves and we need to think, is that the best thing? Not just for us, yeah. but for our families and also for our for our customers and prospects. It used to be the norm. You travelled to a meeting. You would always, even that first introduction on that meeting, you would go there, you'd, you'd, you'd maybe drive for two or three hours, a couple hundred miles there and back in that long day. Will those long days happen for that one hour meeting now? I, I, I'm trying to think if I would do that again. Well, I, probably I, I think and, and so you'd, also, you'd also justify it to yourself and probably to your boss mm -hmm. or whoever mm -hmm. to say, look, I've been busy today. Look, I've been out on the road since six o'clock this morning. I didn't get back till seven o'clock at night. But is mm -hmm. that busy? So we need yeah. to look at it. Well, I think one yeah. of the, so from my own kind of personal experience and uh, well-being under this, you know, I've probably conducted a similar number of meetings that I would have done under normal, you know, think there's people to talk to and engage, whether they're internal, external, the meetings are happening. But at the end of the day, I'm finding that because I haven't spent three hours, four hours on the road, that my email inbox is certainly far more under control. So the way I exit the day when I shut the laptop, actually, I'm feeling a lot better. So again, it's, it is that moving away from feeling like you've always got to travel to, to a meeting. There is a time and a place, but certainly there's a lot more people more comfortable in conducting a sales process completely through virtual environment now so you know think about what what are the measures i guess yeah i think yeah, exactly. you'll find the vehicles will be on the road because they have to be and that, that's definitely yeah. the case at the moment and certainly was you know through the actual through the lockdown and as those measures start easing more and more people will go back to uh driving and going and visiting and doing that but it's just adapting that 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 behavior the, the technology yeah. is now in place a lot of companies got forced to put that technology in place quite quickly uh, which they've more than you know been more than capable of doing. We're all very used to, to using our webcams now. It was always something that we probably would all avoid. No one wanted to mm -hmm. see themselves on a webcam. It was something that was you know very unnatural. Uh, but actually now it's becoming it, it's becoming the norm now. We're, we're doing FaceTime calls night and day. We're all doing Zoom calls with friends and family throughout weekends and evenings. If anything, we're probably communicating more with people uh, than we used to be because actually we spent more time in in cars and journeys. And, and traveling and being busy and um, but were, were we actually being as productive as we could have been so it's a real time to restart and think again about how we do everything to move into this this new normal and prepare ourselves but i think as as we as we restart as well and how we measure people you know as we said before getting lunch is going to take a little bit longer than it might have done previously driving down these smaller roads might take a little bit longer because you can't drive as quickly because the cyclists on the road and things like that so Companies just need to look at how they measure service engineers or delivery people on, on what they're doing because the roads have changed and they're different and they might not seem as busy, but they're busier and things take longer for different reasons now. So they just need to take that into consideration. Otherwise, they'll be putting a lot of unnecessary stress. There's definitely on more that. risk on the road because of what's happened. Yeah. That's definitely it. Absolutely. It's apparent. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, it's a secret. It's, yeah, it's the invisible risk, isn't it? That's what's there at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and then the final one is, is is the risk assessment. So we will provide links for this for access, but it, it is a requirement in the new world for vehicles to display the COVID-19 mm -hmm. secure risk sticker. So again, you know, as, as Chris mentioned with one of his clients doing an inordinate amount of work on the vehicles before they get back on the road with service checks and et cetera, uh, I think it's incredibly important that all businesses are aware of this and, and they're conducting that risk assessment as in line with all their other HSE uh, responsibilities and making sure those those vehicles are displaying the correct stickers because that will be an aid to their to the business in terms of uh, demonstrating to other organizations they're working with that they're compliant and safe to continue to do business with and it's very much designed to get people back to work it's designed to help Absolutely. businesses operate it's not it's not a policy that's been put in place or uh, the way you, you, you build up your your assessment it's not a, something that's put in place to restrict the way you work it's definitely designed to encourage people to get back to work in in the safest way possible. So it's it, it you know it's lengthy to go through as a business we've been through it, uh, but it, it certainly uh, needs to be done. And actually, there's there's some real benefits and and changes to policies and behaviours that, that you can see from within that. Excellent. And we'll we'll be sharing that the link for that for that information at, at the end of this webinar. Um, so moving moving on to the, the next discussion point we want to do is how can technology help? So Chris, really, you know, this is right in your uh, your field of expertise. So, do you want to take us through this one? 
there's a couple of things we always encourage a business uh, to use. Obviously, um, most vehicles either have navigation built into them or people have uh, devices that they've been able to use for navigation. But it's we, we recommend it as a standard policy to always drive under navigated routes. Um, it's very much proven it's a safer way to operate. So even if you know you're going home and you know your route home and you've driven it a hundred times, um, it's actually always put just putting in that destination. It gives you an ETA which ch changes the way you you rush or um, the way you, if you know that you're going to be home on time, you change the way that you you drive your driving habits are. It gives you your awareness on the for speed limits. It gives you uh, notifications for traffic ahead of you if there's any delays. So you can anticipate these things and look ahead uh, by seeing the red uh, lines on the road on various vehicles. You can see the traffic. It's just a very much safer way to 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 drive. With, with, by having a heads, uh, basically a heads up display of uh, the next junction and your approach speeds and things like that. So it was a really um, beneficial way we've seen uh, companies change to be to be using their in-vehicle navigation. And not only just the navigation side, if, if you are um, a, a company with um, technology in place for telematics and driving behavior, it's actually getting that data out of the vehicle and getting it to the driver. The, the driver's not gonna change their behavior unless you've shared that data with them. So it's really a case of, finding a good way of communicating that data to them, a constructive way to coach and encourage drivers to be safer and more efficient in the way they drive. Um, but we, we, we see a lot of technology out there that's just, as, as Stephen mentioned earlier, not utilized. Uh, one of the, the biggest things that we do with the company is go into them to try and uh, help them get the best out of the technology that they've purchased and bought into uh, and get that data delivered to managers and drivers so that they can change that behavior. There's no point in one person in the business having all the data if it's the drivers and the managers that change the business and make it more efficient and, and safer. And Stephen, electronic paperwork, what's your what's your view on that? Well, again, it, it comes back to what I said before. I see it all the time, and obviously Chris sees it all the time as well, is technology is brought in because they want to have electronic paperwork, but it seems to not be used or used for a couple of customers, key customers that request it and not used across the board. And it's not just for customer deliveries, it's for pre-vehicle checks and things like that. And we just need to encourage companies to use this, encourage drivers to use it because it's a lot safer to have an electronic version than it is passing pieces of paper around that again, are just a source of, of transmission. So it's a real key thing that people should focus on. If people aren't as busy and they've got more time, uh, there's not so much pressure on them. Actually, it's a good time to try and get those systems working, make the changes to them because you might you know, potentially be off for the next couple of weeks until the business comes back into play or it's coming back as a, almost a soft uh, return to work. But it, it's a great opportunity to implement some of these technologies and actually make Sorry. them really work the way they should be. And especially if you're gradually bringing people back to work, it's good to get the eye out any of the issues you might have had, why it didn't take, why it wasn't successful with a smaller sample of employees and then you can roll out when more people come back. So yeah, it's a good opportunity and it's obviously a safer way of working. Okay, so um, remote meeting, we've, we've talked about this um, at quite length on the last slide as well, so I'm not gonna dwell too much on this, but you know, you know, Chris said, we've all become far more familiar with looking at ourselves in the camera, uh, remove some of that uncomfortable feelings that we have. So, you know, everybody has technology some of it is is more well known than others but there is lots of it about and um it, it should be utilized wherever possible to to make sure that you know effective time is spent you know and and maintaining social distancing um yeah, i think the other one for, that journey. do you need to do you need to bring yeah, you know, a team absolutely. meeting that's happened in a business every week you know we're always monday morning yeah. is team meeting in the office all eight drivers driving in their vehicles Everyone parks up, they sit down, they have the meeting, and then they head off to do their, their week's work. Does, does that, yeah. that team meeting is happening remotely at the moment? It has to be. Um, yeah. Why bring it back to the office? That It just creates another eight journeys on the road that potentially don't need to be. Correct. Our, our team meetings are, are virtual, you know, and yeah, let, let's be honest, at the beginning, three months ago, they felt awkward. It was, you know, there was a kind of, how, how do you relate to each other but actually you know a couple of meetings in and and they're just as effective as as they ever were you know people voice their opinions webinar and, etiquette yeah webinar <laughs> etiquette a new a new a new way forward yeah but i, I think, think one of these team meetings can be used in any scenario i don't think it just has to be with yeah. a lot about on sales professional drivers but in any in any sort of business you know it's encouraging to get people together because as you say that human interaction is going to be a little bit distanced for the for the foreseeable mm. future so in any scenario you can bring people together it's always good and 
I think people need to look at this a little bit more. You know, just yeah, we, we've seen houses have been Monday morning rented. Yeah, on on using yeah. virtual tours of of houses. You don't necessarily even need to yeah. go and visit certain things. We've seen car sales have still happened um, through uh, virtual tours of cars as opposed to you know, your traditional going to purchase a car and see it physically. Mm. Um, so the, the technology is there. It's just I think it's always been there. Uh, we've always had these uh, meeting rooms with these huge TVs and screens and cameras uh, on top yeah. of them with something stuck over the front, you know, post-it stuck over the front of it because no one wants to see themselves on camera. These technologies have always been there. It's just this has forced us to use it. And hopefully, because it's been you know, a couple of months now, it's now becoming more normal to just oh, we'll, we'll, we'll set up a call as opposed to set up a meeting. And I'm, I'm hoping that actually the meeting won't become the norm, that the call will become the norm and the meeting becomes the right. bonus. And that, that would be my... I also think that whilst people can dismiss this as dehumanizing, I think it's the opposite actually. You know, it's through this, it's been acceptable through a forced situation to have the dog come in, to, to have have your child, <laughs> you know, walk, in, walk into the room. So actually, I think, you know, as, as colleagues, we've probably seen a more potentially more human side of our own private lives than we've ever done so before. And I think that's actually a nice outcome you know from this remote working side of it and and therefore encourage it to keep going and hopefully we don't lose that side of it as we move beyond where we are now today um and i think so other planning uh we come back to planning again about blocking out driving time you know within our calendars mm. uh, they've got the ability to book your uh, your driving time within the calendar um, and so there are tools available within the vehicle we, we work with a couple of companies that will put um, effectively mobile phone tracking or blocking systems in place in the vehicle but most of the phones have it in uh, the technology on itself i think by default a lot of people mm. do turn that technology off um, and actually mm. they will take calls whilst driving but actually you know, do you need to you know if it, do, mm. do you need to take that phone call whilst driving do you even need your phone on whilst driving a vehicle and um, so yeah. blocking out driving time okay. telling people in your calendar that you're driving is just one way mm. to let them know not to call you yeah, yeah. that works well, we hand in hand with the before. discipline of, of of managers not calling as well so as the business yeah. needs to almost develop a you know, a culture whereby, you know, managers respect that somebody might be driving and don't put the call in, you know, and just to see what's going on and, and work with each other in a, in a closer way in that respect. With the, with the technology, it's always easier to just pick up the phone and make the phone call. Oh, where are you? But actually, they've got the technology in the vehicle. They only need to log onto a screen to see where they are or they can see the vehicles in motion. So then yeah. not phone them. But it's trying to get managers to use the technology that's available to them and not the easiest option, which is just to phone them. That, that, that is the yeah. default way to pick up the phone, make the phone call. So trying to yeah. just change that behavior, use the technology that's there. That's the, that's the bit that needs to stop, isn't it? People using the phone just to find out where people are all the time. And it's just, there's different ways of doing it. And it needs to yeah. become the norm that people do it that way. Because yeah. Absolutely. So online driver training. Chris, you're uh, you're at the forefront of some of this with your thought methodology at CDS. What are your thoughts on this one? So we worked with a number of different driver training companies um, to encourage you know, the, the online driver training is quite engaging because people are at home, they're in their own comforts, as opposed to uh, possibly putting an instructor in a vehicle uh, with the driver. The driver will drive uh, perfectly that day. And then the following day, based on the data that we can see, then it reverts back to their historical behaviors. So it's about using the data that you've got from their overall driving behavior and then host taking the opportunity to host an online driver training session. Might be a quick half an hour recap. Uh, highway code based or it could be you know scenario based uh, online training just to give that driver a bit of a recap into to what they should be aware of and what they should be focused on but there's yeah. there's also the, the opportunity to link um, through trigger training so we take um, harsh braking events harsh cornering events and, and understand how a driver is driving in order to trigger a particular training module that we would then share with that driver so if a driver is regularly um, hitting the brakes too hard and, and um, on, on their journeys we can then send a particular um, anticipating the road ahead module to that driver so they can understand how they can adapt their driving behavior going forward. Uh, and is it yeah, worth thinking, thinking about some time. of these things in terms of, you know, before people went into lockdown and saying, picking up historical data, looking at that and maybe preempting some of that future behavior with thinking of, you know, preempting the future behavior that they may just repeat what they always did before and, you know, using this window yeah. to, to identify that. I think everyone's got has passed their driving test. So we're all the best drivers in the world because we passed the test. It might have been five years ago, it might have been 50 years ago, but we, we did the test once and therefore we are all great drivers. The data that comes out of a vehicle is very is very unique between different uh, different people and the way they drive and the attitude towards driving. So it, it is very much um, trying to get managers to coach and encourage through the use of online driver training or even just 
uh, reviews of their data but by sharing with a driver the number of speeding events that, that have occurred the number of uh, driving uh, events that have, that have happened during their journeys and the kind of repeat behaviors that happen just by sharing that with the driver and then leading them into online driver training uh, is a great way to try and manage um, safety for the main priority but also a safer driver is also a more efficient driver in the way that they use the vehicle so you get significant fuel savings come out the back of it so it is a good opportunity while things are uh, potentially quieter or people are at home to, to really start to put some of these practices in place steve sorry you look like you want to did you want to bring come in on no that? so i was just i was just saying about online driver training is obviously the case we've spoken about it a lot during this uh during this discussion about people being more open to webinars and online meetings and things like that it's just to use the online training historically companies a lot of companies used in-car driver training classroom driver training mm. and it was great for that on that day and then not did any didn't do anything with it historically but i think it's to grab that opportunity that people are more willing to do things online at the moment and the engagement for these online learnings are a lot more high or a lot higher than they used to be so that's another benefit of online driver training i think it right. could be more modular as you said the classroom has yeah. to be very specific for the whole day and so forth but yeah exactly, exactly. driver training exactly. Just small modules just snippets regularly is what's going to change mm. a driver's attitude to how they want to drive down the road and um, you're not going to change someone in a day yeah and it's more efficient for a business as well because you're not taking a driver off the road for the whole day and uh you know you can drip read these things through excellent thank you both on that um no problem. so moving on um i think that's that really kind of concludes the discussional point around what actually was the situation that we're in and um what potentially some of the risks are and what businesses can do to help themselves and drivers move beyond where we are today in in, in a safe and and productive way um, one of the things that uh, we at Webfleet have been doing for the past six months um, is quite a focus on well-being, and we have produced a uh, white paper for well-being on non-professional drivers. Um, this, um, along with all the other documents that you can see there from uh, respected organisations and the government, will be sent out to you um, as, as attendees of this of this webinar. So they're all very useful and pr uh, practical resources that you can take and put into practice within your own businesses and for your own drivers uh, to make sure that as people come back into their cars and their vehicles, that they're doing so safely and, and, and well for your business. So also, Chris, you've put together this uh, resource that people can use and take away with them via this uh, QR code on the screen. So a driver app just to help them get back and do some vehicle checks and just take us through that. So we uh, we have a vehicle check tool um, that we use for, for quite a lot of companies to do their daily walk around checks, uh, either on an HGV commercial vehicle or you know a weekly check on a car. Um, so we set up a, a set of questions uh, through this QR code. Um, you can take your phone now and scan the QR code on the screen and that'll take you to the um, the vehicle check solution. Um, you can record your defects, you can uh, just give a driver uh, an understanding of what questions they need to be asking themselves when they're approaching that vehicle for the first time, maybe in a couple of months. And actually, if it's, if it's something that they want to use more regularly, uh, this will be available for the next few months for them to be able to use. And if, if you're interested in, um, in taking this up, then you can contact us and we can do something more bespoke to your individual driver's requirements. I will also send that QR code out after the webinar so people can hand that around to their drivers as well, just to Absolutely. give them a taste of the things they should be should be checking when they're getting back in the vehicle. And then also a little bit, obviously, we've spoken a lot about what, what technology is out there and just want to talk about how we can help. So obviously, we're Webfleet Solutions. We do vehicle telematics, fleet management, and a lot of you on the call might be our customers. I've heard of us before. So if there's anything that you've seen on the webinar that's of interest and you want to discuss about how telematics can help or how to get the best out of telematics, if you are one of our customers, or even talk to us about how you use telematics at the moment and how maybe we can improve that, then yeah, give us a shout and we can help you with that. And that links quite closely to, to what we do. We help manage um, telematics solutions for businesses to make sure that they get the best out of them. Uh, and we, we see significant returns from, from the initial investment in putting in the telematic systems, we, we can make sure that that data gets delivered to the drivers, to the managers, to adjust their driving behaviours and start to see uh, that return on investment that was, you know, was would have been put together in the original proposal uh, to put telematics in, so we can start to see the real benefits. Uh, we've got a lot of examples that we can, uh, different industries that we can, we can show you and demonstrate uh, to be able to work together. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Stephen. Um, that concludes um, our discussion today. 
Um, we're now open for questions, so uh, please feel free. We'll be answering any that have come through, but please feel, please feel free to continue to uh, post those through, and we'll we'll open it up now for a live discussion. Thank you, uh, thank you very much to our team of of panelists for for that discussion. There, I think there were some some really nice uh, topics discussed throughout. So, like we said, what we're going to use now is this opportunity to go through some some questions. That have been um, asked by our audience throughout. So, so the first one uh, has come from a gentleman called Joe. What should be added into the driver policy regarding COVID-19? So, anyone who would like to uh, have a stab at answering that one for our audience. I think we we mentioned earlier about things like uh, encouraging the break section, maybe putting together sort of an addendum to the policy with the additional COVID measures in it. Um, and just including more details around the things that are going to help uh, provide safer and, and more day-to-day um, -day activities around it. So whether it's around driver fatigue or um, attending specific webinars around driving behaviours and things, um, to to really kind of help the driver take that, uh, have that re-look re at their policy rather than just having it possibly filed away somewhere. Yeah. And I, yeah. and I think in most cases the driver policy is is okay and quite good. Just a few little bits need to be added around what Chris just mentioned. But I think, as we said again, it's a real good time to reinforce the uh, driver policy and communicate with drivers about the driver policy and what is in the driver policy and what they need to do. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Uh, a question here from Helen. So historically, uh, they've always done their driver training face to face. Uh, they're quite curious uh, on how the online driver training compares and kind of its effectiveness to the traditional face-to-face -face style training. So I suppose that might be a good one for, for Chris, uh, given your experience in the sector, to ask for us. The, the feedback we've had from the driver training is the change to go from our classroom uh, teaching uh, on everything we do, not just driver training, on everything we're now learning online. Um, the driver training modules that are available online, as we said, they're very modular. You can pick and choose what you want to learn or specifically tailor that uh, training experience to individual drivers rather than having to run a, cl a classroom that's uh, for everybody. You can actually set uh, individual uh, modules based on their driving experience, based on their driving events and data that we can take from the system. So it can be more bespoke uh, as well as actually being more engaging uh, because it is tailored to that individual rather than a generic classroom environment. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, looking back to kind of earlier in the discussion today, we, we were talking uh, very much about the kind of health and well-being side. Um, and one of the questions that, that's, that's come in is, is around the nutrition side. So how do you encourage your drivers to eat healthy? And I suppose this is, uh, this could figure from my personal experience, so you're kind of, you know, you're rushing back from a meeting, you want to get home, you forgot to get your lunch, you kind of rush into a service station, you grab what you think is probably healthy off the shelf, but you know, this might not necessarily be the, uh, the healthiest thing. So, so how do you kind of encourage this change in, 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 in habits uh, for drivers? And especially, uh, you know, as you alluded to earlier on, that some service stations may be shut or reducing it, redu uh, operating at reduced capacity. Um, I mean, for me, I think one of the things that, um, you know, we had on one of the slides, but didn't really, I guess, um, put across was the center of that little wheel, which is around communication. Um, and, and as people come back to work, be, be clear on, on a communication plan around not, you know, as we talked about policy, but also about the nutrition. Um, we are going to put a resource out, which is the white paper, which contains quite a lot of information around driver health and well-being and the nutritional aspects and sleep aspects um, that, that make it better, uh, a better experience for the driver during the day. So I think making sure you've got an, um, the right communication plan as people come back that includes all of that information and, and that education. Um, but also possibly to think about how does the expense policy work? You know, does the expense policy encourage the right behaviors in terms of purchasing food? You know, we talked about lunch boxes, ensuring there's water. So I've seen a number of activities that business can think about that actually continue the driver eating and, and, and drinking enough fluids to keep them healthy. Excellent. Thank you for that, Richard. Um, a question here from Dan. What is involved in the, in the risk assessment, uh, particularly around the kind of vehicles themselves? So from a, a walk around perspective, uh, sort of to made, or the vehicle itself or more COVID-19 based? I think, I think more uh, COVID-19 uh, related, yes. 
I think on that risk assessment, I mean, it's a big detailed document that the government's provided on the uh, on what you need to do for the risk assessment. So I think they they need to look at that. I mean, there is lots of key things around cleaning the vehicle and as we said about single use of a vehicle and who can do what with a vehicle when they have it. But it really is very detailed in that risk assessment. So I think if they go onto the government website and follow the resources we've provided and get hold of that risk assessment document, it's pretty clear what they need to do for a vehicle. Excellent. Well, what I would add to that, though, Stephen, is, that, is the fact that by doing it and displaying the right stickers, you're giving confidence for other businesses you're now interacting with that you are compliant. It's it's quite it could be quite a powerful piece to make sure the vehicles have, have got that exactly. in. And that compliance piece goes outside of what traditionally probably was the audience. You know, there's more people involved in this compliance around COVID-19 now from people on the doorstep, from people these people, from people they're visiting on a day to day. So it's really important that companies get to grips with it. Um, and I'm not sure, you may, you may not be aware of this one yourselves, uh, it's probably in the guidance, but just in case you are, is, is it mandatory to display a COVID-19 secure sticker in a vehicle, uh, a, a business commercial vehicle? I imagine it, it could be specified somewhere within this new documentation, a bit like the, the non-smoking sticker now become mandatory. Are any of you aware at all yourselves? It's, it's mandatory to put it on the business premises to say to your employees that you've done it, but it's recommended that you put it on anything that related to the to the business that needs to be used, so vehicles come under that. Excellent, thank you. Um, Richard is, is it's, it's not so much a question, but I suppose it's, it's more of an awareness around drivers coming back to work it's obviously around their mental conditions. So he's kind of alluding to the fact that as businesses, we need to be aware or ask questions around that kind of generic mental health and states, because you know some people might be anxious about getting behind the wheel, going back to work. Um, is there any kind of advice we can offer around that? Or is it more a case of, it's just uh, companies need to be aware and, and, and speak to the right organizations who can assist them through that process of, of dealing with, um, employees coming back to work after this kind of lockdown period? I think it's, um, so three, months three months and uh, not coming back to work after three months is, is the most time I think any of us have ever been off work since probably we would have started working. Uh, so there are hopefully some positive changes in individuals, whether they're motivational or reduced anxiety because they've had time to relax, but, but to just jump back into work and be expected to without really communicating with, with drivers and with employees is it, going to be a bit of a challenge with the well, well-being side, a lot of uh, companies are putting in place uh, return to work discussions, the same as you'd have off, after any any long-term break off work. So you're having constructive discussions, discussing the things that have changed in the business in the time that they may have been off, if they haven't seen various communications and things. So it all, it, for me, it's, it's all about communication. Uh, we keep we up to date with employees that are off at the moment, uh, that we're regularly keeping up to date on on uh, calls, interactions, uh, keeping up, up, just having general discussions with them. So as long as the company is communicating well to the individuals, you've got a good chance of being able to get them back to work uh, in a constructive and, and formal manner. And I would also say, Chris, that the, a number of certainly corporate organisations I've worked with do now um, have um, mental health first aiders, as a lot of them are called. Uh, and actually, maybe that's a resource that can be can be utilised on a you know on a phase basis as people are coming back in, just to you know have that that conversation and make sure that people are comfortable in themselves and coming back. Yeah, and also flexibility as well. I think companies need to be flexible about what people can and can't do when they're coming back from this long period. I think that's important as well. We mentioned it a lot during the presentation, but. Excellent, thank you. Right, I think we've probably got time for maybe one or two uh, quick more questions and then and then we will wrap up today. So uh, a question here from James. Um, a second. What do you think is the single biggest risk to drivers at this time, apart from COVID-19? So I suppose these drivers are getting back in the wheel first time. What would you say? I suppose there is a, mul I, mean, I mean, listening in today's session, I would probably say myself there's a multiple of risks that need to be considered rather than just one single, single largest risk. But I know in my, my go on, sorry, go on, Chris. I think the, the biggest risk is going to be that it's that first five minutes of being in the vehicle. That That's going to be the riskiest part, uh, whether you're getting into it and you've been used to a very small vehicle that maybe um, maybe it's got a reverse and camera, it's got parking sensors, and you get into your van or your company vehicle for the first day, and that's not got a camera and it's not got the parking sensors, and you've 
it, that that's the time where you're at risk and it's a big difference between an old and a new vehicle as, as we said in the presentation around if, if you're normally driving a small vehicle and you get into a van that stopping distance is going to be very different in the van so it's just reminding yourself that you are in a different vehicle uh, and you don't just jump in head down the road and then start changing mirrors moving things around and just take a bit of time in that first uh, that first opportunity back in the vehicle maybe five or ten minutes familiarizing yourself with everything that's there and, and preparing yourself for your journey and that would be yeah. my, my assessment uh, and, and as you I mentioned think, Chris, he's using he's using the navigation you know get the navigation switched on take away the, 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 the that additional thought process of having to think do i turn left or do i turn right because that's going to help you you know remove some of the distractions around as well and roads might have been closed in the meantime you did the new routes being changed to a lot of um, as we said into the towns they've changed it to be cycle lanes on certain roads yeah they're going to be on the navigation device to to make you aware of it so uh, speed limits may have changed in areas that you're not going to necessarily know of so firstly making sure your navigation device is up to date you know it's three months since it's, it's, you might have last used it so plug it in get it updated get the latest maps on it uh, as i said speed limits might have changed anything might have changed around you and um, that you you just if you don't put in your destination which is something we always encourage drivers to do and um, then you, you might not get those benefits of the, of the technology that's there for you excellent thank you well i think uh, i think that's most questions covered there's some uh, observations i think that have been made by people uh, Sally mentions here that she, you know, the amount of people she's seen, for example, going to supermarkets with their PPE on, and then kind of jumping straight into their vehicle with that PPE on, and kind of just transmitting potentially that virus to their vehicle. Again, I think it's it's just an observation that, again, drivers and, and employees are likely to be aware of the risks still around this virus, kind of, um, and think about, you know, PPE is, is good to have, but you know, you should be taking it off before you get back in your vehicle. Uh, what I think would be really good is to invite you back, uh, the three of you, maybe towards uh, the later part, tail end of this year, probably in autumn, uh, and we can get together and, and do a shorter session, kind of uh, see what's changed, really. Uh, I imagine the policies are going to be quite evolving over the next few months. It would be really good to bring you back together, give us a bit of an update. We could possibly look at those traffic flows at the beginning. So, yeah, if any of our uh, attendees are in today, we, we plan on running that, and I think it'd be great to get your opinions and views on that uh, in the autumn time. Uh, today's session has been recorded, so it will be sent out in the next 24 hours. So please, uh, if you'd like to share this with any of your colleagues, um, please feel free to do that. And of course, you can reach out to, to any of the team members uh, in today's uh, webinar, any questions you may have. So uh, thank you very much, Richard, Stephen and Chris. Thank you for everyone who's attended today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, Lexix 4 webinar.